In this video, we'll be examining the meaning and use of the Shadow Girls in episode 10 of Revolutionary Girl Udna, as well as their meaning in general. Spoilers will follow. The Shadow Girls appear in almost every episode of Revolutionary Girl Udna. Before the third act of each episode begins, the Shadow Girls arrive to tell the audience a story related to the events of the episode. Before we discuss their specific use in the episode Nanami's Precious Thing, I'd like to go over my general interpretation of the Shadow Girls. The most important reason for the Shadow Girls to exist is that they are inexpensive. Shadows are easy to animate and the segments always use the same background. However, just because they were cheap doesn't mean they lack meaning. One of Revolutionary Girl Udna's strengths is that it utilizes its repetition meaningfully. It's an example of art from adversity. Each of the Shadow Girls' plays begins with the ringing of a gong and this frame being overlaid onto the image. Simultaneously, the screen takes on an orange hue. Before a duel with Utena, the screen shows the forest the duels take place in, but in episodes without a duel, the contents of the frame vary. This signals to the audience that what's just taken place is important, and that we are transitioning into the third act. The orange color is to simulate twilight. The setting sun mimics the episode's coming conclusion, as well as casting the long shadows the girls use to put on their plays. The dome at the top of the frame mimics the dome at the top of the chairman's residence, the looming power of Akio in society. It is decorated with a rose, the symbol of Akio's game, which he uses to control the duelists. Ancient Grecian culture is a recurring motif throughout Revolutionary Girl Udna. Grecian architecture and statues appear throughout, and Anthe's name is the Japanese version of Anthea. Anthea is the name of the Greek goddess of flowers, as well as a name for Era, goddess of women and marriage, who is married to her brother Zeus. The Shadow Girls are an example of a classical Greek chorus. I am by no means an expert in Greek plays, so I can't speak too deeply as to this connection, but I'll give it a try. In early Greek plays, the chorus was a group of anywhere from 12 to 50 performers who would sing, dance, and speak as a unit, distinct from the main actors of the play. In traditional Greek plays, there were at most three actors who performed all the roles of the play. The chorus traditionally did not affect the events of the story. The chorus's unified movements and chants would signal the start and end of the play, as well as create interludes between scenes, giving actors time to change costumes. The Greek chorus helped create a common structure, which allowed the audience to more easily follow what was happening. Similarly, in Udna, the Shadow Girls marked the rising action of each episode as well as giving a parable to help the audience understand the episode's meaning. Greek choruses often represented the general populace, and would comment on the events of the story from that perspective. They weren't omniscient narrators. Likewise, the Shadow Girls often represent the conventional moral view of the episode's events, which isn't necessarily correct. This is reinforced by the Shadow Girls' connection to Plato's Allegory of the Cave. In the Allegory of the Cave, Plato describes men who are kept in a cave underground, with their heads bound so that they must look at a wall. Shadows are projected onto the wall from behind the men, using a fire and cutouts. As the prisoners would never see anything but shadows, they would take them for real objects and think themselves knowledgeable. If you were to take a man up to the surface to see light and real objects, it would blind him at first, and it would need to be done very slowly so he could acclimate. Upon finally seeing sunlight and the real world on the surface, he would want to tell the other captives in the cave about his discovery. Going back into the cave, he would be unable to convince any of the other captives that he wasn't crazy. Having seen only shadows and firelight, they have no conception of the real world. If you've watched the whole series, it should be obvious that this allegory follows the basic character development of Anthe to a T, and a strong case could be made for Utna as well. We only see the girls' shadows as a reference to this story, and as a signal that we shouldn't trust them. They are projections. I discussed episode 10, Nanami's Precious Thing, in my last video. Today, we'll just be looking at the shadow girls scene. This takes place immediately after Nanami is given a rose crest ring by Toga, and immediately before Utena duels Nanami. I'm going to refer to the girls as Girl A and Girl B, because I'm pretty sure they don't have names. 
てみて、子猫拾ってきたの。なんてお名前つけようかしら。馬なんかどうかしら。そんな平凡すぎるわ。もっと変わった名前ないのかしら。変わったかも。にゃん。うん、そうじゃなくて、もっとセンスのいい名前ないかしらん。センスのいい変わったとま。だから違うわよ。もっとこう、可愛らしくって覚えやすい、品のある名前ないかしらん。可愛らしくて覚えやすい、品のあるセンスのいい変わったとま。もうわかったそんなにたまがいいんだらたまでいいわよ。<笑>おいで、ジュリアノ。もう可愛い名前でなくてもいいってば。A wants a cute name for her kitty, but is either unable or unwilling to name it herself. She asks for increasingly specific kinds of names and gets the exact thing she asks for back from B. A eventually loses her cool and says that the cat's name can be Kitty, but B finally delivers an actually cute name for the cat, who has now grown to a monstrous size. In this scene, girl A represents Nanami. Nanami wants to define her relationship with Toga. According to her childhood memories of him. But Toga's playboy routine and negligence of Nanami don't reconcile with the perfect big brother Nanami imagines him to be. Nanami refuses to take responsibility for her relationship with Toga and takes an entirely passive role in it, even though she's heavily invested in the relationship. This mimics how A refuses to name her own pet cat, even though she's the only one who'd really care about what his name is. By the time a satisfactory name's been given to her, the cat has gone from cute to dangerous, and the name no longer fits. Nanami still sees Toga as the kitten he was when they were young, and not the predator he's become. So that's it for this one. If there's another Shadow Girl play you would like me to talk about, then let me know. I've got another long video coming up, but I wanted to get this one out there in the meantime. Thanks for watching.